hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. Kind of like that lady went to the funeral, and boy, that preacher was doing his best to make that guy sound like such a great guy, and he's the greatest this and the greatest that and greatest this. About halfway through, his widow got up from the front row and walked up and looked in the casket, and he, they said, oh, it's all right. I know you're going through it. She said, no, I'm okay. I was just making sure I was at the right funeral. <laughs> so, hey, all you know what? All I can tell you is we've got a great big God, and he can do a whole lot of something with a whole lot of nothing if we're willing to let him go to work. Amen. It's an honor to be here, and I do. I love you very, very much. I love your pastor and his family. We, I'm so thrilled to be in Porter, Texas. We have had, it's just revival going crazy. I think seven new families last week, five new ones this morning, and uh, I think 50-something new guests just in the last two weeks. And People, I mean, they're just coming in off the streets. It is absolutely amazing. But I'm here with you tonight. I love, love, love them, but I also love you. And that, that ought to mean something. I'm going to tell you, I said, well, I'm, I'm going down there tonight also because I'm going to borrow your pastor here in a couple of weeks. And so trade, trading is fair. Amen, amen. Um, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, very quickly. I was reading here, here, uh, it's probably been a couple of months ago, I was sitting, or uh, going through the computer. You know, every now and then you get these things on the computer, and it says, this happened so many years ago on this day. And I was reading, and uh, it came across the screen, and said, on this day, I think 30 years ago, or whatever it was, in 1988, it said, uh, Whitney Houston... Her song had finally reached the top hits or whatever and remained there at number one for so many months. And it was, you know, this song, Where Do Broken Hearts Go? And it said, on this day, this many years ago, this song went to the very top and it, it started going. And, and I, I just, you know, it's just one of those things. Every now and then you see something you've never seen before or you've seen it a thousand times and you just see it differently. And I was sitting there and I was thinking, I was, you know what, I've never even thought about it. Where do broken hearts go? I thought, you know what, it may not mean much when she wrote it, but then when you find out that later on in 2012 she died after having, I mean, pro, after, most of us were like, man, if we had your money, we'd give ours away. I mean, it just, if we had the houses, if we had the cars, if we had this, and yet despite all the wonderful things she had, despite all the blessings, the finances, the opportunities, the, the popularity, all these things, we find her battling uh, depression. We find her with drug problems and alcohol problems, relationship problems, suicidal thoughts, and finally, you know, taking her own life and going through this or whatever it was, overdosing, just terrible, terrible, terrible way to end one's life. And you read and you sit there and you wonder, how can someone who has so much, according to the world's standards, end their life in such a wreck and with so little... And then I began to think about it. I thought, you know what? Maybe it wasn't just a song to her. Maybe she really was wondering where do broken hearts go. And it couldn't have just been her. Because in order for something to be a number one hit in this world for month after month after month, that means there's something about that song that has to resonate within enough people that they call in and say, hey, that's the song I want to hear. That's the one. You know what that tells me? That's not a good thing. That means there's that many people in this world that are wondering the same thing. Tell me, where do broken hearts go? Where do I bring my messed up life? Where do I go when no one wants what's left of me? What do I do with my family when it's only in pieces? What do I do with the marriage that doesn't even look like a marriage anymore? What do I do with the future that only looks like a past? What do I do with a messed up life? And just just out of curiosity, I went to the year that this song was number one on the hits. And I, I thought, I, I wonder, in that year, it was KTFA, if anybody remembers that in this area. 92.5, KTFA. And uh, that was the Christian station. I went and I looked, what was the number one song during those times? And when I looked up, it said number one during that exact same time was Our God is an Awesome God. I thought, oh, if we ever could have connected a broken heart 
to an awesome God. Oh, Whitney, I'm sorry, but there was somewhere you could take a broken heart. And to the rest of the people out there that were wondering, what do I do with it? If only they could have realized, hey, there's an awesome God, and he's got all the power in heaven and earth, and he will take a broken heart. When you don't think anybody else wants it, he wants it. He don't only want it, he can change it. Amen, amen. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 6 through 17, and for time's sake, I'll read very quickly. But it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not us. We are troubled on every side yet not distressed. We are perplexed but not in despair. Persecuted but not forsaken. Cast down but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body for we which live are all way delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith according as it is written. I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Let me tell you, when you come up against life's problems, you ought to look in the mirror and say, hey, this ain't going to last forever. For a little while, I'm going to go through some affliction. But for eternity, he's going to make it up. I'm going to go through a trial for a little while. But the blessing and the victory will not be for a little while. But it will be eternal. This is working out for my good. I don't like where I'm at, but it's working for me. I don't like what I'm going through, but I am going through. I don't like what I'm dealing with, but I'm not all alone. I don't like it or understand it but I'm not in it by myself where do broken hearts go Lord Jesus we love you this evening we thank you for all that you've done so many of us in this place we know what you can do with a broken heart we know what you can do with a broken life but right sitting close beside us is somebody else and they don't know yet that you can do anything with a broken life but I pray tonight that through your power and authority and anointing God that you will wake up something within each and every person that is in this place that you would bring life to what is dead that you would restore what the enemy has destroyed and that we will walk out of this place tonight knowing that we shall not die but we shall live and we shall be walking living breathing testimonies of the power in your name in Jesus name can you give him a hand clap tonight hallelujah we thank you Jesus thank you Jesus you may be seated won't be very long. Let me tell you something. You may be broken. One of the first things you're going to have to realize is God uses broken things. Everybody else looks at something and they think, what are, what are we going to do with it? How do we make this what, what it's supposed to be? God's eyes are so different than the way we are. We look at something and try to say, you know, what, what, what can we do with this to make it what it's supposed to be? But don't break it. God looks at it and says, how are we supposed to make it what it's supposed to be? Let's break it. The, 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 the disciples they're sitting there how are we going to feed 5,000 and they bring a lunch and the disciples are like how are we supposed to do this maybe we can find enough people with stuff like this that we can offer God's like no 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 this is enough oh but this is nothing he said oh not when I break it when I break it oh you don't understand when it's broken in my hands it doesn't just come apart and it's never any it multiplies more than it could ever be he blessed it and he broke it and the scripture says, and he took of the broken. So it's the reason God hadn't been able to do anything in our lives is because we hadn't been willing to be broken in his hands. All you've got to realize is, listen, the same hands that were breaking you are going to bless you before it's all done. And there won't be enough people in your life to sing the praises of what God's going to do in it. If you're willing to be broken, I promise you the blessing's going to last far longer than the brokenness. 
He goes in, he tells Gideon, he says, I want you to get this light and I want you to put a barrel on it. But that light don't do anything inside an intact barrel. The enemy's not afraid of the light inside of you that doesn't shine through. Oh, well, I got Jesus inside. Oh, that's precious. Nobody knows it. It's the best secret in some of our lives. And God's like, that's not going to do anything. You're not going to like what I'm about to put you through. And by the time it's done, you're going to be broken in more ways than you've ever wanted to be broken. But out of that brokenness, I'm going to shine into every area of your life. Those people that say they never come back to God, the light that's going to shine through your broken situation is going to do more in their life than every tract you've ever handed to them. The family that you don't think will ever live for God. The attitude that you have during brokenness. Oh, I'm worshiping but I'm broken. How, how do they smile like that when their life's falling apart? He said, I'm going to shine through you and there's going to be lives that are changed, not because you were unbroken but because you were broken with the right spirit. Oh, I was sitting there here that, you know, I'd been pastoring. I hadn't been pastoring very long. I don't know anything at all yet. In fact, I call Brother Tuttle just about every other day. It feels like we, he basically pastors two churches because I'm getting advice just about every other day of my life. I'm like, hey, listen, uh, I don't know what to do with this. And if, if you know Brother Tuttle, he may not know either, but he's going to come up with, with something. I've never put him on the spot yet. I was like, man, that's great. Where'd you read that? Oh, I, just, I don't know. It sounds good. No, no, I'm, he's got so much experience, it's just ridiculous. And uh, everybody in the whole world knows what's going on in Eastgate. So, I mean, my goodness, I got, I've got great, great help and great wisdom there at my disposal. But I was sitting there, and it, right after I had I'd taken this church, or it, it only been, it's probably been about four weeks ago, and I was sitting there. And, and I was dreaming at night, and I was sitting there, and I was looking back. We've been having so much revival. We've just been having people come in left and right. I mean, Bible studies going here. And I, I'm just sitting back. I'm like, this morning, I, I, I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. There's so many visitors here. I can't get to everybody. And I, there's about 15. I didn't even get to. I feel like a horrible person. Cause, and I don't even know what's going on because I'm not that good at this yet. I don't know what's going on. I'm like, well, I, I, did they close an exit down? Were they going somewhere else? What, 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 I don't know what's going on. I'm not doing anything different. That's what's amazing at God. All of a sudden, you're just going along, and he can just begin to do things in your life you never even dreamed about. So I'm sitting there, and, and, and in my dream, in, in my dream, I mean, it was so real. I had it several times, and, and I kept remembering it. And in this dream, I was sitting there, and I was staring. Our building looks very similar to this one. And um, I was sitting there, and I, I was on the platform, and I was looking out. And, boy, I've been sitting here, and, you know, we all been praying. We're like, God, send us a millionaire. God, send us the billionaires. God, Everybody wants, you know, oh, the perfect family. I want someone that, that they already know how to play the keyboard. Their kid plays the drums. Their next next door neighbor that comes with them every Sunday sings on all the right notes and all the right keys and they don't want to do nothing but serve it's just I mean that's you know that's kind of oh they just they just try to go around picking up trash off the floor I mean they just you know everybody wants them and I'm sitting here and we're like you know do this and do that and in, in a dream I, I don't know what God's face is like looks like but this face in my dream it, it, it like it came I was sitting there on a platform and it came through the top of the building and it was just looking around and it was as if this face all of a sudden looked over me on mine I sit on this side in the platform and it was like this face looked down into the into this church I, I call it my church very loosely it's his church but he looked down into it and it looked over at me and he said and he asked a question. It didn't say who can go here. He said, the, the question was, who can live here? Well, now, I, you know, I, I never thought about that because, in fact, when I went to retell someone the dream, I, I told him, I said, and he asked me who can go here. And immediately my mind, I was correcting myself because he didn't ask me who could go here. He said, who can live here? 
and something got, I woke up and I was sitting there. I remember sitting there and I was thinking it was so hard on my mind. I started telling the church about it the next morning and I started thinking about it. Who is it that can live here? Who is it that can come? I know we want this and we want that and everybody wants the perfect people, but let's just face it. There ain't a lot of them left. There's not a lot of perfect people walking around. If they are, they're they're angels in disguise because it's a messed up world we live in. It's a messed up situation. It's sin has run rampant in our society and it's destroying lives as fast as they can get put back together. Divorces are happening as fast as they can say I do. People are falling as quick as they can barely get their feet out from under them. I mean, it's it's crazy. And this question, I, I couldn't get a hold of it. So I got up and I started looking and I started thinking, okay, God, who is it that you think can live here? And I started looking at all the people that Jesus spent his time with. I find a man named Zacchaeus. They said a sinner. He's hanging out with a sinner. Who wants to be friends with a sinner? He's cheated on taxes and his taxes. He's a thief. He's this. Nobody wants to hang around with him. And yet Jesus walks up and says, hey, I don't mind going home with you. Nobody else may want to, but I'll go home with you. Then he walks in. There's a woman with an issue of blood. Nobody invites her to the parties. Nobody wants to talk. The doctors don't even want to do with her. Oh, she's sick. She's got, oh, there's some things going on. Jesus said, hey, I can stop long enough so that I can heal you. I can stop right there for you. You matter to me. We see a blind man that everybody walks past and he calls out to him and Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus stood still. He said, hey, I'll stop for you. Nobody else will stop for you, but I will. It goes to a woman caught in adultery. Oh, we're going to kill this one. Who wants to let her live? Jesus said, I'll let her live. I'll let her live. I know she's messed up. She's made a lot of messed up mistakes, but I still love her. He goes to a soldier, a soldier that doesn't even know that much about him, that has a servant that's sick. Oh, who? You did, Jesus, you don't care about them. They don't even believe the way they do. They're a hypocrite. They're a reprobate. Jesus said, it's all right. I'll come to your house. I'll pray for what you need me to pray for. The thief on the cross says, oh, remember, how you, how you going to remember him? She says, I remember you today. Then we got a demonic man. Nobody. He can't go home. His family don't want him. The job don't want him. Nobody wants him. And yet he runs up to the feet of Jesus. God said, hey, I'll heal you. You can live here. You can live with me. You're good enough for me. It's all right. Now, now don't, get, don't get it twisted or get it wrong. He said, hey, you can come here. But you're not going to leave the same. He said, Zacchaeus, you're going to come. I'm going to go home with you. But you won't be the same Zacchaeus tomorrow. Salvation's coming home with you. To the woman with the issue of blood, hey, you can live here. But it ain't going to be the way you used to live. You're going to be healed this time. To the blind man, hey, I'll stop for the blind man. But I won't leave the blind man blind. Hey, the woman called in adultery, I'll forgive you. But listen, go thy way and sin no more. I don't want you living the way you used to live. To the soldier, he said, hey, I want to see that faith come out of your life to the thief on the cross hey I, I, I believe you but I want there to be repentance and salvation to the demonic man I'll save you but I want you in your right mind I hear too often oh you you just come any way you want to yes you can But don't stay that way. You can come in, mess it up, twist it up, broken in more pieces and you can pick up. But don't be content to sit somewhere and be a thriving corpse. We got too many dead people filling up pews. Now, I, I don't, I, I'm not talking to you from, uh, you, you know me well enough, I've been here. Oh, oh, especially now that I'm pastoring. Let me tell you, I wish with all my heart I could stand on a platform and tell them how perfect people do perfect things. And God blesses them, and I know he does. But I can't tell that story. I can tell you about messed up life. I can tell you about bad decisions and dead end roads. I can do all that. But there's something that I used to terrify. I mean, I was talking to a minister a while back. I told him there's something I don't understand. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Yeah, some of you still, you, 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 uh, come on. Some of you, you still still living in fear, wondering who's going to open that closet door one day. Somebody's going to see all the skeletons. Yeah, I'm halfway shouting, but I'm terrified of the day that's coming. Get in line. (laughs) But yet I know people that have been monsters. And I don't think any, they're dead and gone and nobody ever 
found them out. And I was talking with a minister and I saw something how I'd never seen it. He kind of helped me with Maybe it's not that somebody else will find me out. How about this? Years go by. Boy, Sunday night, man, it's a shout down. You're picking up bobby pins for two days. I mean, it's gone crazy. They, they think you went to the gym instead of church. I mean, it, you're, oh, you shouted all over the place and you got victory. Monday, you're witnessing to everybody. And as good as you've made up your mind, I'm never going back. I'm never doing this. I got the victory, sweet, sweet victory. I mean, you oh, you're singing it. And then Tuesday, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, bam. That memory hits you in the face and it's as vivid on Tuesday as it was the day you messed up. And boy, we're saying, well, God, I thought you said you forgave me and you cast it as far as the east is from the west and that you didn't, you remembered my sins no more. He may not remember them, but we do. And they keep finding us. My past just keeps finding me. I pick my head up and I think I'm doing good. And who I used to be shows up and says, Hey, I couldn't find you Sunday night, but I found you this morning. Here I am. Remember who you used to be? Here I am. I haven't gone anywhere. And we go back to church and we sit back in our pew. Oh, why are you acting so different? Oh, it found me again. I thought I got away, but I hadn't gotten that far. Hey, if the only time you're ever going to be able to worship is when there's no longer a memory of who you used to be, then you're going to be confined as a slave to that pew for the rest of your life. What you got to remember is, hey, there's some things that may never leave my mind. And every time they come, you know what? I'm just going to find somewhere and thank God all over again. God, thank you for delivering. Well, I don't even know what you're talking about. You may not know what you brought me out of, but I remember what you brought me out of. I remember who I used to be. I'm praising you for something you don't even know exists anymore. Oh, you don't need to, you don't need to settle on who you used to be. No, but you better not forget it. Cause we better never forget where God brought us from. And we sit there. And we just a carcass on a pew somewhere. Just a carcass. That scripture, t- I was sitting there. And boy, it's just been with me. It hadn't left me. It won't leave me alone. And I'm sitting there and I keep seeing that face looking down at me saying, Hey, who can live here? I don't care who can go here. And I don't care about the perfect people. There's billions of messed up lives out there. Everybody wants the perfect people with the pretty little thing. Oh, come on. But Stevie, listen, you can't worship here like that. Too many perfect people here. These altars are for perfect people. No, no crying and bawling here and looking like you got a problem. Hey, easy with that. And meanwhile, you got somebody every morning of their life out there. They get up, maybe some of them in here, and they're just barely going through saying, oh, I know everybody wants the perfect people, but who wants me? Who wants the messed up life? Where can I go? I don't want to just go and exist somewhere, but where can I go that I can live again? Where can I? I know people will let me go and sit on a pew, but where can I go and I can live and I can breathe and I can do a work for God and I can be all that he's called me to be I don't want to go die somewhere I want to live I don't want to just be a mended family no I want to live in peace I want to live in victory I want to live to see my babies worshiping God I want to live to see a ministry take place in my life again Let me tell you, I got up on Sunday and I'll tell you what I told every one of them. Hey, for every one of you mamas and daddies worried about what your kid's going to be, you go home and tell them today they can live here. They can live here. Go tell every drug addict that you see, hey, I know somewhere where you can live again. I know somewhere where we're not going to hold what you used to be against you, but you can be changed. Tell the alcoholic, I got somewhere not just for you to go to church, but somewhere you can live and feel life and be restored. He said that I came that you may have life 
and life more abundantly and sitting on a pew every service living in regret and slowly dying all over again is not life more abundantly. Some of you are still sitting there. Uh, there's nothing for me to do. There's more things around here. I don't even know what there is to do, but I promise you, there's more to do. I, yeah, I wish I had a thousand people. I could give them all a job. Well, 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 I really have a pulpit ministry. If the only ministry you got is a pulpit ministry, you don't have a ministry. I need somebody with a Bible study ministry. I need somebody that says, hey, I got a kitchen table and I got a Bible study chart. I may never grab a microphone, but I can turn this church upside down. You may not have a microphone or a pulpit, but you got a kitchen table at your house. I don't understand. There ain't nothing I can do. If you got a five seater car and four people in your family, you got an open space to bring somebody here every time. Even if you got to go to the bad part of town to get a messed up person to fill it up, go get them. God can touch them. If you go over into 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. You can be seated. I'm going very quickly here. Musicians, I, I don't know. We may be closing. We may not, but you can go ahead and get ready if you want to. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7. And he said, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Some of you, the best thing ever happened to you was being broken. Let me tell you something. I don't like being broken. But my attitude then and my attitude now, not saying it's perfect, but it sure is a lot different. It's hard to walk around like you got all the answers when the memories of who you used to be don't get any weaker day by day. He said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice. That it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. He said, oh, there's a messenger from Satan. I'm so glad he didn't say it came from God. Oh, it really was from Satan. God just allows things to happen. He said, and it came. He said, and I asked God three times, take it. I can't handle it. I'm not putting words in the scripture. I'm not adding to. I'm just kind of thinking here. My imagination goes crazy sometimes. I just wonder in light of who I am and in light of what I know about people. I just wonder if maybe the thing he could not get over was the memory of who he used to be. Maybe his sins found him out the same way ours do. Can you imagine? He gets that pen. And he gets ready to write. None of these things move me. Neither height nor death. nor Boy he starts talking about the goodness of Jesus. And all of a sudden the memory of the rocks hitting Stephen in the face. Maybe the memory of Stephen's mama over there. Tears falling down her face as her baby's killed and murdered. Right in front of her for nothing other than loving God. And this monster holds the coats and watches in righteous indignation. As he's murdered in front of his own mother's eye. Maybe that memory comes back how many times did he watch others as they were murdered for believing the very thing he believed how many times in the middle of writing that scripture did the memory of who he used to be come upon him and all of a sudden with tears in his eyes he takes the pen and sets it on the table and said, I can't write this look who I am look where I came from God, it got to be somebody better than me that can write this. Oh, let me tell you, maybe I'm doing it all wrong, and maybe I've had people like you don't ever say that in front of me. Maybe I'm too real. I, I, I probably do. I probably open up too much. I, I, don't, I don't know. I only know how to be me. 
I get in my own pulpit and I tell them, you don't know how many times I get up here. And I open that Bible and the first thing I think is, what do you think you're doing up here? Who are you to be up here? They got better people in the teaching of Sunday school over there. I'm just being honest. Who do you think you are? And you don't know how easy it would be to just, God, you're going to have to send somebody else for this place. The memory's too fresh. And the transgressions were too, too big. How many times do you think Paul laid that pen down and said, God, somebody else is going to have to finish this book. Look who I used to be. God, you're going to have to take this from me. God, you got you, you to please deliver me from this. And he said, no. He said, I asked him three times and God would not take it from me. He said, I asked him thrice that he would depart. And he said, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly. Therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I can see him say, hey, what are you doing? Get that pen back in your hand. But God, look at who I am. Who do you think you're writing to, son? Perfect people. There's somebody with a messed up life that's going to be reading that. And when they read it, I want them to know that it was a born again monster that wrote about the goodness of Jesus. I want them to know it wasn't perfection that wrote about grace. It was someone that had been in the same situation. I don't want anybody that don't know about grace telling me about grace. He said, the reason I left that thing reminds you of who you used to be is so that you can write those words, not with a smile on your face, but with tears dropping off of your cheek. My grace is sufficient. I don't want you writing that with boldness. Oh, my strength is made. No, I want it in brokenness. My strength is made perfect. And weakness. Oh. Come on. You're going to have to wake up and realize. If you're waiting for the day where who you used to be no longer comes to haunt you, it will never come. You're going to have to wake yourself up, grab yourself by the nap of the neck, say, hey, we got a lot of reasons to sit down, but we got some good ones to keep going. I know I'm not perfect, but I refuse to die here. I'm not going to die in the memory of who I used to be, but I'm going to live, and I'm going to be known as something better than what I used to be. My children won't know the stories. They won't recognize the stories of who daddy used to be and the daddy that runs the aisles. They won't even believe who these people say mama used to be because it will be so different than the mama that prays every single service. And my grandbabies won't even know the stories are true. I will not die, but I will live. Come on. Where do broken hearts go? Where do I bring what nobody else wants? Where, do, where does the marriage go when the marriage don't feel like a marriage anymore? There ain't no counselor that can do anything for this. We haven't even talked to pastor because we, we don't even believe there's a shot. Where do we go? To the altar. Oh, you don't know what I've been doing. My life outside of these walls ain't nothing like my life inside of these walls. In fact, you see me when I'm not in here. I don't look nothing like what I look tonight, preacher. Where do I go? You're here. Oh, you don't know what I'm going through. We're shouting and we're praising and everything in me is falling apart. My heart's been poured apart. It's been ripped into shreds. I don't know what to do. Where do broken hearts? Who wants me? He does. And he don't just want you as you are. He wants to change you. And in the middle of your brokenness, if you allow him, if you say, God, if I'm going to be broken anyway, I'd rather be broken in your hands than out of it. Life will break you. 
whether you're in here or you're out there. The difference is out there you're just broken. In here it's but for a moment. And what comes after the brokenness is far greater than what you think the brokenness brings. Out there you're just broken. But in here you're broken on the way to blessing. Out there my marriage is broken. And it's never put back together. In here my marriage is broken. And through the power of prayer and through faithfulness it becomes stronger than anything it should have ever been. Let's don't pretend. Let me tell you, I've been there. You walk into a church and it looks like everybody's perfect. Boy, they got everything right. Everybody matches and everything. It's really precious. I sit there and everybody was coming up and boy, they were, and they are, and it is. It's a great church. But they were coming up to me like, you sure got a good church. And this one came and said, oh boy, you hit the jackpot on this one. Someone else come up and be like, oh, man, it's the greatest thing. I'd only been there, and they do a lot of counseling there, and there's a lot of people call, a lot of people coming in the office. I hadn't been there for four weeks, and somebody told me that right before. Probably shouldn't have told me right before I got in the pulpit. I got up there and said, listen, we worship like we, we ain't got no problems. We sit there like it don't need to be us. I hadn't been counseling but four weeks, and I can tell you, we as messed up as the rest of them. We ain't got any perfect families here and your kids aren't walking, breathing angels. We need an altar more than anybody needs an altar. God help the person that doesn't move something, doesn't move them to an altar. Let me tell you, you're broken whether you want to admit it or not. And you got issues. Some of you, your issues got issues. I can lie to you. But if we're honest, we all have problems. It may be something you're messing with or it may be just something that's happening to you. But you're either in a battle, going through a battle, coming out of a battle, but everybody's fighting something. Where do broken hearts go? Here. In the arms of a wonderful loving God but you're going to have to make up in your mind I may have come here broken but I'm not going to die this way there's some people sitting on these pews and some even standing around here for years you have been exactly where you are because of something that happened to you or because of something that somebody did to you forgive them and get over it Bitterness will kill you. It's like an acid that destroys the container that holds it. I don't care who did you wrong. Here's how bitterness works. We get so bitter because of what somebody did to us. And us being bitter doesn't change their life one iota, but it destroys ours. We come into the house of God and because I'm mad about what so and so did to me or how they treated me, I can't worship, I can't lift my hands, I can't speak in tongues, I can't repent, I can't get a breakthrough. Meanwhile, they're running the aisles 40 miles an hour. Forgive them and get over it. Forgive them. Forgiveness is for you. When I forgive someone, it's for me. It's the first step in healing. Well, it wasn't fair. (laughs) It never is. Life's not fair. But I don't want to die here. Just a reminder of what I could have been and who I should have been and what I could have, what could have happened. I don't want to die this way. I want to live. I don't just want to go somewhere to a church where I can breathe. Where can I live? Pastor, can I live here? Hey, I know your pastor good enough. I can tell you, you can live here. You can have new life here. God can touch.